Hypothesis testing. We're going to start with discrete variables here. Now we have this situation where Luke really likes Pepsi and he claims that he can tell whether an unlabeled cola drink is Pepsi or not. How can we actually test whether he, his claim is true? So you might set up an experiment and perhaps get him to taste test, uh, for example, 10 drinks. We'll, we'll just uh, use this example with a sample of 10. Get him to drink the 10 drinks and uh, state whether it was Pepsi or not and count how many times he got that right. So how many correctly guessed um, attempts would actually prove or disprove his claim? How many of the, out of those 10 would you count as being proof that he could do it or not? If he got 10 correct, then you would, um, you know, that's pretty easy. You can say, yes, he can make that statement. What about if he got 9 out of the 10 correct? Would you still say that he could make that claim? If it was 0 or 1, then that, again, that's easy. You can say that, no, definitely not. He can't do it. But what about if it was seven or six, somewhere in the middle? Where's your cutoff line for uh, deciding whether you're going to accept his claim or not? Now, this is what hypothesis testing is all about. The null hypothesis assumes that it's all random and Luke can't tell the difference. So just saying that it's down to chance and he's got a 50-50 chance of guessing whether uh, the drink is Pepsi or not. So we're, we're taking the... Um, we're, we're assuming that he's wrong to begin with for the null hypothesis. We're assuming it's just all down to chance. chance. And the null hypothesis is given this notation of H with that subscript of zero. Then if it was all down to chance and X was the number that he guessed correctly, it would follow a binomial distribution where we've got 10 trials and the probability of success is a half. He's just got a 50-50 chance of guessing that it's Pepsi or not Pepsi on each drink that he takes. Now this x value is called this, the test statistic um, and that's what we're going to test against how many he actually got right and whether we're going to say that that number is good enough to accept his claim. Okay, so if x follows a binomial distribution we'll get the following probabilities. The chance that he gets all 10 correct is really small, 0 0.000977 as you'd expect. Now the chance that he gets 9 or more correct is getting a little better but it's still very small and then so on with eight or more correct and seven or more at what point are we saying that that's enough probability to accept his claim so when does that probability become high enough that probability that we're talking about is called the significance level of the test that's the point we're going to say okay it's not random anymore it's actually getting to the point where we're going to accept that claim Generally speaking, we talk about being um, unlikely being less than 5% and very unlikely less than 1%. A lot of the significance testing we do is at the 5% level. Now the critical value is the cutoff point for that significance level and it gives us the critical region or the rejection region. So if we test Luke's claim at a 5% significant level, we want the first value that gives a probability that's less than 5%. So we're getting into that unlikely range, so that if it was random, it'd be highly unlikely to get that result, so it's less than 5%. Okay. So remember the numbers that we had before, we'll just copy those across. The probability that x is greater than 7, that, that's not the one we're looking for, because that's 17.2%. Um, that's um, quite a high chance. We've got probability that x is greater than or equal to 8 is 0.054%. So if you got 8 of them correct, again, it's not, not close enough. It's 5.447%, um, but we're looking for less than 5%. So we've got this one here, where x is greater than or equal to 9. So the critical value we're looking for here is 9. He would need to get 9 correct for us to not think that it was just a, a random thing that had happened. And our critical region is that x is greater than or equal to 9. So in reality, he could get 9 or 10 correct. OK, so this is how we note it down. The null hypothesis is that the probability is equal to 0.5, where p is the probability that Luke guesses correctly. The alternative hypothesis that we're testing, we call H1. That's that the probability is greater than 0.5. In other words, that Luke can guess more than um, 
you know what you would think would be random so he can get get it correct more than half of the times so the significance level we're testing to is 5% now this is a one tail test because we're interested in whether the probability is greater than a critical value um, at other times you might look at whether it's less than a particular value and then um, what we'll look at in the next video is two tail tests where it can be um, outside of a a, a range above a value and below a value, but this one is a one tail test. Values that aren't in the critical region are in what we call the acceptance region, so that means we would accept um, the uh, the the change in in the in what we thought was happening for just random events. Okay, so the test value is the number of correct answer that answers that Luke gives. Now, if the test value lies in the critical region, then you reject the null hypothesis in favour of the alternative hypothesis. So this means that Luke can pick out the Pepsi. So if the test value, the number of um, Pepsis that he did get correct, uh, lied in that critical region that gave you a probability of that happening as less than 5%, then you would say that yes, you're accepting his claim. If the test value lies in the acceptance region, you don't have significant evidence to reject that null hypothesis that it's all just random, and you accept it. And that means that Luke would just be guessing, and he doesn't have, um, he can't make that claim with the 5% significance level that he can uh, correctly identify Pepsi. Now in practice, we don't calculate each of those different levels and see which one's closest to 5%. We calculate the probability of the result of what happened, so we know how many he got correct, and we test to see whether it exceeds 5%. So in this example, we're going to say that Luke guessed 7 of them correctly. So what you would actually do is work out the probability that x is greater than or equal to 7. Now note this is not the probability that x equals 7, because we're looking for a crit critical region here. We want... The, f the chances of him getting seven or more correct um, to be um, less than 5%, okay? So that one came to 0 0.171, which is more than 5%, which means it does not um, go into the critical region, so we do not reject the null hypothesis. Let's look at another example. Trent has a lucky coin which he thinks is biased and turns up tails more than heads. When it was tossed 12 times, we got 3 heads and 9 tails. We want to test at a 5% significance level whether the coin is biased towards tails. So, we're going to define our variable first of all. Let x be the number of tails obtained. Our null hypothesis is that p equals 0.5. In other words, the coin is fair. Our alternative hypothesis is that the uh, probability of getting a tail is more than a half. So under our null hypothesis, we have that x is following a binomial distribution with 12 trials and a probability of success is 0.5. Our alternative hypothesis says that we can get a probability more than 0.5, that it's biased um, in favour of tails. Okay, so now we test out whether um, that probability of getting the nine tails in, in our example um, is significant enough. So we're looking for that region, remember, not just that, that x equals 9. We want the probability that x is greater than or equal to 9. So we add up all of those values there for 9 upwards until 12. Now we get 0 0.07299. Now this is bigger than 0 0.05, or bigger than 5%. That means it's not in the critical region, so there is not significant evidence to reject the null hypothesis. In fact, we're going to reject Trent's claim that uh, his, his coin is biased. We're going to accept the null hypothesis that the coin is fair, because the conditions that we had don't give us any evidence to suggest that the probability of those that happening would be less than 5%.